Welcome to Ageless by Rescue. This podcast is devoted to exploring the science of rejuvenation, uncovering the most trusted experts, the must-have products, innovations, and technology in the field of vitality, aesthetics, new beauty, and cosmetic enhancement. Oh gosh, I'm so excited to welcome Zoe Bingley Pullen, my friend, incredible nutritionist, chef, um, television personality to Ageless by Rescue. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, absolute honor to be here, darling. Thank you for asking me. You know, one of we had a conversation, I want to say, nearly a year ago uh, at the Yacht Club, and we were talking about um, the importance of nutrition uh, as part of perimenopausal and menopausal health. And I asked you why you think um, this is an important topic that you're going to now really deep dive into. And, you, you know, you looked at me with a twinkle in your eye and you said, because it makes you look better. <laughs> mm. It's a funny thing, isn't it? I mean, as a holistic nutritionist, I think what we need to understand is that we do shine from the inside out. And it, it's really important that we not only set the foundation in our nutrition, but what we are mentally capable of doing, what we are physically capable of doing. As we all know, I'm homeschooling, you're homeschooling. So we have to be realistic about what we can and can't do. But if we don't, you know, if we don't have good nutrition, as the foundation. And I think the other way I like to put it is if you don't have an interest in using nutrition as medicine, then often what we're doing is we're kind of circling all these other areas, all these other modalities, trying everything, but really we just need to set that foundation when it comes to what we're eating on a day-to-day basis as well. So I always get excited when, um, particularly as I change, you know, I'm 43 now, I found out when I was 39 from doing, you know, six years of IVF to have Emily that I was going to hit perimenopausal, you know, stages early. And I thought, fuck, I was like, not another thing I've got to kind of battle through. So I started to try and look at it from a curious perspective. Um, Look at what all the data is actually saying to me and also look at kind of what I guess the general conversation is around something like perimenopause because it it still feels very unknown and it still has a very sort of cliched feeling around it, as does menopause. I mean, I think we're getting a little bit more understanding about menopause, but premenopausal stages, we're still, it's still a little bit of a big, you know, question mark because it's this duality that we're li- living at that point in time. I mean, statistically, they said it's the first time in a female's history that we've often got young children and older parents, and we're going through a big change of ageing a- as well. So you're living with all these different p- perspectives and not necessarily knowing which one you kind of fit into correctly as well. I would love you to tell the story of how you got into nutrition and became a chef because yeah. I think the what you learnt uh, from the French yes. is actually a really interesting perspective that you have yeah. woven into your clinical practice. And it's not only um, life-affirming, but it's quite, uh, you know, it seems to have come full circle, uh, yeah. what you learnt from the French and living in France and, uh, and being yeah. taught about nutrition there, and now what's becoming quite fashionable. So I'd love you to share that journey with us and then uh, let's talk about your clinical um, sure. Look, I think um, I, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, so for me how I actually got into loving food was um, I've got ADD and dyslexia, so school for me was a very challenging environment. I am quite grateful now having a seven-year-old of what teachers do because I definitely didn't appreciate what they were actually doing. And so for me food was kind of, my mum was a very good chef I had or very good cook, um, all of that, I had chronic eczema and I had all these things. So my mum was very uh, curious and she really did, you know, she she did a lot of lead work and a lot of homework about sort of why you shouldn't have gluten or why you shouldn't have dairy and all these foods in your diet. So I had that as my base diet from a very young stage. But it wasn't kind of until I studied at the corner, but to be really honest, I went to London. I was quite young. I wasn't even 18 when I went there because I was young for my year. And just blew up, put on 10 kilos. I 
had never really self-managed my diet. It had always come from my mum, who loved, like I said, loved food and put good nutrition on our plate. So I was a very confused person. So it wasn't until I went to France, because obviously I was studying in London at the Cordon Bleu, and then I got the opportunity to work with someone in France, that it started, it all started to kind of embed and make sense. Because the, the premise around uh, the French style of eating is that you eat to live. You know, you love every aspect, the way, you, the way you sit at a table, the way you converse with people, the way you choose the product. Everything has a sensual, passionate kind of extension. And so for me that became a very, found, the very foundation of why I love nutrition. And as a result, within six months, all the weight I put on in London was gone. I was eating twice the amount of food that I was eating in London, but none of it was processed. I was drinking beautiful quality wines, which is very sort of new to me as well, not beer and thing, cheap alcohol that you drink when you were 18, you know, 17, 18 in London. And so it just, it just became exciting. And I think that's, you know, I've started, you know, lots of different businesses around nutrition and one of them, which I trademarked, which was called Falling in Love with Food. And there's books and there's online programs. And I think that's kind of became the word I wanted people, the saying I wanted people to live, fall in love with food. We're not children. You can have a chocolate. You can have your wine. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, but let's not be unreal. You know, let's not be you know, silly about this. Food has to have a positive slant for it to, to work. And so if you can put a very positive love-based environment around food, whether it be the cooking, the choosing, the smelling, whatever it might be, the learning of food, it's going to embed and it's going to stay there and that foundation will be positive and then you can build from there as well. So it really was, yeah, an you know, exciting journey. And I guess that segued into the television show you were on for years, which was Good Chef, yeah. Bad Chef. Um, yeah. And I think that that experience and that um, knowledge that you passed on to an Australian audience was really interesting uh, that you, you don't have to be at war with food. You can actually. Um, choose. Mm. It, it actually segues me into a really um, interesting conversation, which we've had before as well, but I'd love you to share your point of view on this, um, particularly in this, um, you know, biohacking space that I'm delving into mm. with Ageless. Um, there is a lot of conversation about the power of nutrition and mm. dietary choices and regiments and lifestyle eating habits and how it can help not only, uh, you know, treat signs of aging and aging is considered as a disease in some circles yes. it's just a dis-ease um but also you know how it can reverse aging so mm. I'd love you to share your perspective on some of the big you know topical uh, things such as intermittent fasting uh mm. plant-based eating paleo and yeah. and your thoughts on how this impacts hormonal sure. health and um Vitality. So I think before we sort of jump into that, we probably need to understand a little bit of how hormones work. And I think what, what's important is that we need to understand it's all governed by something called the endocrine system. So the endocrine has got this amazing capability of called it's called a negative feedback system. So to give you an example, if you are living in a highly adrenalized world, which pretty much is everybody we know you're going to have something that will kind of compensate. So often we might find that thyroid then compensates in that area as well. So we just have this sort of, you know, balancing act, a continual balancing act that's happening as well. So I think before we jump into sort of what the trends are, we need to understand a little bit about how the, the body works when it comes to hormones. So what we have is we have something called the endocrine system. And, and basically what that means is that that endocrine system governs all our neurochemicals, all our hormones, and we've got something called a negative feedback system. So they all work in homeostasis. They're all trying to be at balance. So, for example, if adrenaline's really, you know, if you're high adrenalizing, then maybe thyroid might step in or pituitary might step in. The problem with that is that, you know, we need to find a balance. So when we look at specific diets, Often what they're doing is they're generalising. You know, they're giving one general viewpoint on sort of why that diet works. And it does work. You know, it often works brilliantly for a lot of cohort of people, but it might not work if you're somebody who's thyroid-based, you know. 
when you're looking at thyroid function, the worst thing you can do is do something like intermittent fasting because basically there's no consistency in the way that you're actually eating as well. You're constantly putting your body under a state of shock. So decreasing calories at certain points in time is not the best idea to do. The other thing we need to look at is all hormones are metabolised through the liver and the kidneys. So if you don't start there, then really it doesn't matter what you do, you can't actually support the body through detoxifying hormones and getting, you know, that balance in the correct hormones in the body. So when I work with a client, we very much start, we start raw. That's kind of the way I like to put it. We start basic. We look at liver. We look at what is happening in their lifestyle that actually is not supporting that function correctly. And then we start to put beautiful nutrients in there that might be through food. It might be through supplementation that can really get in there and support that liver function really effectively as well. You might also find that someone's diet is so, you know, their gut is so, their microbiome is so bad that it doesn't matter, you know, what's happening, their their neurochemicals are going to constantly be affected. So you might need to start there. So it is important we look specifically at a person and not necessarily at a diet to get the best result when it comes to hormonal function. Uh, I'm going to tell everyone that, I came to you to do all of this for me when I was pregnant with Lily. So this is, uh, I guess, 11 and a half years ago. And um, (laughs) you remember? Um, So you you did my entire um, assessment and a diet for me and I cooked all your recipes. And um, it was it was really a, a. it was a, I mean, hugely hormonal time in my life. Yeah. So um, we really took, you educated me about the importance of understanding pregnancy hormones. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, I'm in the next phase of my life and we're having this yes. conversation. <laughs> but taking it back to that perimenopausal and menopausal, tell us what happens to your body and how nutrition can support the yeah. hormonal fluctuations and change. Um, to support uh, vitality and youth and great skin and great, um, yeah. you know, energy. So what you, what you mainly have is a change in, in estrogen, that that's the most basic, and other hormones will compensate in that area. So, so I guess um, to look at it really clearly, so you perimenopause is the first stage of our estrogen levels dropping as well. So you might just have very sort of size low symptoms, low signs, you might just have a little bit of slight, you know, inconsistency in your periods. You might find it's the point in time when you're getting a little bit of flushing, your libido might be changing a little bit, you might notice that anxiety. That tends to be the the symptom that most of my clients kind of come in. They're like, I'm anxious, I don't know why. And obviously, you know, we kind of go, we go through some of the basics. We look at sort of what, you know, what is happening, what lifestyle, but often it's because of that change as well. What we can do in that period is is actually quite supportive, though. We can really knuckle down and we can look at liver. We can really help to kind of let the body at least be metabolising all those hormones effectively as well. When we go into sort of the more menopausal stage, there's there's stronger degrees of change as well. So what you, I believe, you know, what I've worked with my clients is nutrition and supplementation is so important through that area as well. This is where we can really start putting a lot of different herbs in there. We can put a lot of different things that can support because often what happens also when your estrogen levels drop, we don't absorb, you know, the effect, the way we absorb calcium and vitamin D changes as well. So we have an increased risk of osteoporosis, you might also notice that psychologically, I and mean, I've just, um, I'm a trained counsellor as well. I've just started to do a lot of psychotherapy courses and sort of anxiety um, and grief in all of those areas because we do feel, because there's not a lot of support for women in this area, that that change is a loss. You know, we're, we're losing something as opposed to gaining something. You know, so it's very important that we sort of frame what we're gaining you know, as opposed to what we're losing, because when we feel like we're losing something, it's going to increase our anxiety, our depression. You know, we feel there's a loss of youthfulness and we feel there's a loss of love for ourselves as well. So it's important that you integrate all of that sort of positive reinforcement. So I do a lot of kind of visualisation with my clients and get them to try and, you know, look at this as a positive change. We do something called blowing up the balloon, which is literally we look at, we name that emotion And when we slowly breathe into that emotion, it's not that we're letting it go, but it's literally a balloon that just sits up above us that we, you know, we're just kind of holding as we go through the changes of life as well. And then we start framing using different words in there. So it's so important because, I mean, the reason why I mentioned that is that if we don't support the mental side of this through this, 
it perpetuates all the physiology side of it as well. So we have to look at all angles to get the best results. And tell me about some of the specific um, dietary changes that you recommend in your clinical practice yeah. and supplementation. I know that it, it's always, uh, you know, uh, based on consultation. So it's not, yeah. you're not uh, prescribing, you're advising on a more general level. Yes. But what are some of the quick wins that, you know, our listeners can uh, can attend to or consider? So what you want to do is you obviously, you want to work on the quickest way that you can affect hormones and insulin is probably the quickest way that we can affect hormones. So what we want to do is we just want to start looking at getting all those refined carbohydrates out of the diet as quickly as we can. A ketogenic style diet does tend to be quite supportive in this area. Not that we necessarily, and I'm quite holistic in my approach when I look at ketogenic. I've always been a big uh, supporter of a high-fat, high-protein diet, but then I incorporate it with a low-GI-style carbohydrate. So when we talk about glycemic index, it's something that I've worked with for years and years, and it's still one of my favourite guides, if you like, about carbohydrate because it's not about taking potatoes out. It's about having how much do we have in them, what can we eat them with. When we actually eat that food, rather than having spiking our insulin levels and dropping it down, it's a slow release of insulin. So we feel mentally better because we have a constant supply of glucose to the brain. Energetically, we feel better. And, you know, nutritionally, often we're getting a better type of food. So that's the quickest thing that we can do to kind of, you know, modify and support the body. It's also understanding that we do need a very alkalizing type of food. And I know we sort of throw that word around, but to give you an example, we just need to have a high carb based diet in this area as well. So we need to make sure that we've got a lot of raw plant-based foods. Juicing can be a really simple way and having a little bit of structure around that and really kind of giving simple things like, I guess if you wanted to know what a day looked like in this, you would basically wake up in the morning, you would have a little bit of hydration. I always said at least 200 men, your body needs to actually just flush the system out as quickly as it possibly can. So looking at about 250 to 300, even 500 mils before you leave the house is perfect. Apple cider vinegar, it's very alkalizing. I personally can't take apple cider vinegar. So I'm someone who I just find it's just a little, even though it doesn't create acidity, it's just a bit too raw on my gut. So I lemon or lime like that as well is really important. We put some good probiotics in there as well. And then we have a breakfast, which is just so deliciously supportive with all those good fats. So it might be that we're doing a chia pudding, but we're putting hemp seeds in it. We're putting lots of nuts and seeds in it. We've got some beautiful fruits going in there as well. And then we might be throwing in some beautiful herbs into that. You can throw turmeric into that really nicely. It's important when, if you are using turmeric, what you need is something called pepperine and you need a lipid. You need a fat to act to make the curcumin component come out of the turmeric, to make that active, which is curcumin is the active component, the anti-inflammatory, you know, the antioxidant that we actually need. But you can put a little bit of coconut oil, you can put a little, you know, a twist of pepper into that, you know, chia pudding with the hemp seeds in it. And then I think it's really important that a level of organisation comes into play because if you're not being, I always say, if you don't have good, cupboard support if you like you don't have good fridge support it's really hard to be healthy you know and there are some amazing online services out there that can actually support you through that process if you're someone who hates cooking I always try to excite my clients at least having just the basics of cooking you know you don't have to be a, a cordon bleu chef to be a great cook but you know you just need to have a couple of different meals each day that then you can sort of change the protein or change the vegetable but it will still give you something that is delicious as well so I always think of writing a food plan, writing a bit of a shopping list, putting a little bit of structure. I mean, believe it or not, now can be a perfect time to do this. I mean, we're all, if you are in Sydney, we're, we're all kind of a bit locked in right now. And having a plan around eating does make it a lot easier. I know with homeschooling, I'm having to, you know, M's on a Zoom <laughs> meeting right now. I've already put her snacks for the day. I've got my snacks for the day. I've already put out the food that we're going to have as well for lunch because if I had to give a lot of thought to this, you know, you know, if I had to kind of sit there, you know, when I am hungry or when you know, Emily's hungry, it, it just wouldn't turn out to be as nutritionally beneficial and it would create stress as well around that as well. So we've got same- to, um, so we've got uh, pre-breakfast and breakfast. What, what do you suggest for lunch that's kind of hormonally yeah. supportive? 
Yeah, so what we need is lots of good fats in there as well because the fats are not only the big anti-inflammatories, they've got all the things that help support, you know, hormonal function. So if you can do something like a, a really oily fish, if you are an oil, a lover of fish, you know, your, your salmon, your trout, your sardines, all of these types of foods are just gorgeous. So I do a really simple um, salmon dip. It's so easy. You make it Sunday. It will last you till Wednesday easily, which is literally just salmon, coriander, grated carrot. And if I've got some other herbs, I'll throw that in there as well. And I'll, hemp seeds are kind of like my absolute go-to for life. I'm an abs- I'm a massive believer in plant-based medicine, CBD, all of these areas I think are huge growth areas. Um, they're going to be just something that will give us so much more ability, you know, they can work from everything from anti-inflammatory, but often what's really interesting about it, they're sustainable, they're great for the environment. But when you look at things like hemp and CBD, they, particularly hemp, hemp has the exact ratio of three, six, and nine omega fats, which is exactly the same in the ratio that the human body has. So we absorb it really effectively as well. With so your I'll, salmon dip, is it tinned salmon or fresh salmon that you bake and then look, dip up? In an ideal world, it's fresh. And in an ideal world, it's wild or like, you know, lion caught. That's not always realistic. So we kind of sometimes do need to be realistic about what it is that we're getting into our diet. Um, I will find that I've kind of got a bit, always got a little bit of a fallback. So I've always got the tinned, oh, I've always got the tinned in there. So to answer your question about the salmon dip, it's a little bit of both. You want to have, if you've got the time to make the fresh, beautiful baked salmon, you make it in large quantities. And then you can just throw that through. And if you can't, if you can't, you can have the tinned. Sometimes the benefit of the tinned as well is that you have the bones and the skin in there that you can mash up. And in the bones is calcium and glucosamine. You're not necessarily obviously going to eat the bones of the salmon when you bake your salmon yourself. But again, there's lots of ways that we can have more of a plant base. So you could have some beautiful nuts as the base. You could have lentils as a base, chickpeas as the base, and really just mash it all up and then make a gorgeous green salad. I've always got a huge amount of sort of roasted vegetables that I do on the weekend. I put them into jars, lots of olive oil in there, a little bit of salt and pepper, or might be some herbs in there as well. So then I can just pull those into my salad and throw it, throw it in with great flavour, great nutrition. In the afternoon, I think is for most of us is when our blood glucose levels are starting to fall as well. Things like licorice tea, aniseed tea, what they naturally do is they naturally kind of help to stabilise blood sugar levels as well. So you might find around 2 o'clock, you're having lunch at 12, popping something like that in there with some beautiful fresh, fresh fruit. You might have some, you know, lovely nuts in there. Um, right now, Ziggy's yogurt is my favourite yogurt. It's something I found in America that we finally brought here to Australia because we don't always do great yogurt in Australia. <laughs> I should know why. So it's a really easy product that you can, you know, again, throw your additional hemp seeds and nuts and seeds and have that there ready to go. In the evening, I'm still a really big fan of your protein and your vegetables. So it might be that again, we're trying to, I'm trying to make something that Emily likes. So we might do like a sweet potato mash, but again, I'm putting coconut oil into it. I'm putting lots of olive oil into it. I'm dosing it up with all of those good fats. We might have a little bit of lean red meat. I'm more partial to lamb again, because lamb indirectly is grass fed. It tends to have a slightly higher nutritional profile in there as well. Uh, but it's quantity is the big thing in all of this. It is so important that you just have low, low quantity. So about 100 to 150 grams of red meat. And what does that look like? What does 150? Probably about, like, good art, like we say, palm size, but also palm width. You know, we don't we don't need a lot to get all the good nutrition from this food and more it's about the quality of the product. It's better, you know, having less red meat in the diet and better quality red meat, going for the organic, going for the plant fat. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go circle back to what you were saying about the liver because yeah. um, I would love a little bit of education around the function of the liver in metabolizing the hormones, as you were saying, and also liver cleansing or liver boosting uh, foods and dietary practices that you recommend in your clinical practice. Yeah, so liver is, oh my God, it's this most forgiving organ. The, the liver has one of the most amazing abilities to regenerate. 
but you do need to be supporting it as much as you can. I often find in this particular area, supplements work really effectively. Um, you've got some you know, a lot of things like your barley grasses and your wheat grasses can be incredibly supportive for liver health as well. They're also a little bit supportive when it comes to thyroid function as, as well. So we've kind of got that double-edged sword in there as well. So when it comes to metabolizing the liver, basically everything gets funneled, for want of a better word, through the liver. So if you think about it, it's a cumulative nature. If your body's having to kind of metabolise a poor diet and hormones, well, what is it going to do first? You know, it actually has to basically get through the, get rid of the toxins. I always say if you're drinking alcohol and expecting your body now then to metabolise everything else, it won't. It will go through what is the most toxic thing, what has the biggest threat in the body, and that's why it's so important we're just letting the liver do its job without confusing it and complicating and bombarding it with a poor diet that then means it has to metabolise the food that we're eating and the hormones as well and everything else that we're possibly doing. So this is why we try and go for as clean, you know, fresh, unprocessed, you know, we don't add too many, you know, overt sort of, you know, processes in, in cooking where it takes all the good nutrition away with it. And we try and go for a start a diet that has has basically the ability to you know, support liver function. All your bitter foods also are brilliant. So the bitter your, foods, the bitter foods. So your lemon and lime, your rocket, your chicory, all these sort of peppery type lettuces. They're brilliant when it comes to also supporting liver function as well. So I kind of find that if I can always incorporate one of those foods into every meal. I love the taste of these types of foods. I, I'm more partial uh, to a more sort of bittery, salty, you know, type food. Um, so I don't find it too hard. But if you can slowly incorporate it, it might be as simple if you don't like those types of food of having a salad dressing, which is kind of apple cider vinegar based instead of your other vinegars. So I, I do a great salad dressing, which is the ratio of three to one. So it's three parts um, apple cider vinegar, two parts olive oil, and one part, it might be a good quality sea salt or apple cider, as a um, tamari soya sauce. It's got that lovely umami kind of flavour to it as well. But that's beautiful. That's just a really well-balanced, something that at least can support gut and support liver over there. Um, what about detoxes? Are you a fan of liver detoxes, celery juice or juice fasting yeah. to kickstart a sluggish liver? Yeah, look, I, I am. And again, it's client specific. So if I feel that someone will do it, but they're not hate every process on it and then won't do what I ask them to do beyond that, then you know it's great. But there's no reason why you can't incorporate those foods into your diet. Like I'm, I'm like I said, we I do a cold pressed juice every single day. It's something I just on don't. an empty stomach or any time of the day yeah, is okay. Yeah, really, any time of day, any time of day is fine. And for clients, I find that sometimes this is a great way to have uh, your snacks, beautiful snack that you can have it. I've never been a fan of the celery juice. I just can't do it. So I've tried it every which way, but that's just because I don't like the taste of it. Uh, I'm sure, you know, there's lots of research, but again, I'm not a fad-based nutritionist. I'm not someone who actually believes in following one particular fat, I'm all about incorporating these foods into a good base to get the best result out of our diet and the most sustainable emotionally and, you know, interest-based and the falling in love with food premise that we can continue to do. But a juice can be really simple. You know, you can have so your, beach, your big beta carotene type foods, which is great for collagen and elastin pathways. You know, we need all those vitamin A's because basically they help to boost collagen and elastin. So, Incorporating those types of foods into the diet can be absolutely beautiful. I'm a massive fan of things like bone broth and, and what have you. I mean, I always take a bit of a giggle out of this one because when we studied at the Quorum Bleu Cooking School, what everyone calls bone broth, we call stock. So it really is. I love that. It's yeah. just stock. <laughs> it's just stock. But uh, it was a way, you know, my mum made stock was basically, you know, putting all the bones in, letting all the marrow, all the collagen, you know, the good old Israeli soup, you know, it's the type of food that just takes everything out of the basics of food, you know, the poor man's food, if you like, and takes all the good nutrition out of what we're actually getting from that food. So I think it's a wonderful thing to incorporate into it. I'll even put things like if Emily, you know, if we're, Emily's getting a little bit, you know, a bit unhappy, a bit, you know, a bit bored, I might even put a little bit of bone broth, cold bone broth into a juice that I'm making for her as well. She doesn't know it's in there. I also find a great way to kind of boost up 
my own good nutrition, I'll throw that in there, but I'll make my stocks, as I make my risottos at this time of year, I make my soups at this time of year, but always using these types of foods. I'm a big believer also of having those good fats, not just coming from olive oil, but really good quality butters and stuff in your diet as well. Can't take the Frenchie out of you. Um, no, what no. about <laughs> what you think is just really detrimental to hormonal health and beauty and skin yeah. glow? Yeah. Are there anything that you really advise against? Yeah, look, I think um, it's cumulative by nature. So uh, obviously alcohol is a real, a real problem. I think, um, you know, yes, do I also kind of roll my eyes at that. But I I uh, personally did three months of no drinking um, this time last year, which was brilliant. It was I did a lot of podcasts. I learned a lot about sort of, you know, the psychology around drinking, the normalisation around drinking and just tried to kind of, you know, tweak my neurons and reframe it in my brain of how, how it works. Because what we know about alcohol, it, it basically dehydrates tissue as fast as you, you know, it's the biggest thing to dehydrate your body. Uh, we know that when a body's in a state of dehydration, one of the things will happen is our stress response will go up through the roof, we'll retain fluid as well. That's one of the big key things. Um, when the cells, you know, expand with fluid, they can't do their jobs functionally. There's less cellular communication going on. So it's really important that, you know, uh, alcohol is something that is seen, as my dad always used to say, you you drink alcohol to make yourself feel better, not eat. So you drink alcohol to make yourself feel better, not just, you know, not just, you know, a little bit okay. So, you know, that's, you, we're going to use alcohol in a functional way. So if you are someone who's a regular drinker, my advice to you is to have at least, at least 24 to 48 hours. It takes that long for your body to metabolise. So it takes about 24 hours. Wow. Time to metabolize alcohol, and then you need a day for the liver then to be able to go back to doing its normal job before you drink again. So every third day is the best way to drink, and then quantity. I mean, there is no safe. We we know so much more about it now. There is no safe safe amount to drink alcohol. Um, so we, you know, the recommended daily intake or the recommended weekly intake is ten units. One unit is is hundred mils, so that's about that much of wine. So which is what you know most females tend to drink as well. So it's really making sure that if you're, yeah, you know, you've got to look at this kind of not as sort of what's the perfect diet, but what are the cumulative factors that's going on. So if you're stressed, you've got a poor diet, you've got alcohol, you're having your daily coffee, all of it might be within the daily recommendations, if you like but it's where the way it accumulates on the liver as well. So it's really important that we kind of sometimes just take all of that out. We just focus on a basic diet. So this is when sometimes your detox diets do take, you know, a really good, I mean, I've done a two week, do my, I've done this two week detox diet with my clients for years, but it's not about extreme eating. So it's just about having a good plant-based style, high fat, you know, good animal protein. We take out all, all, all that, so good plant protein. We take out all the animal protein and all the dairy products. And we just give two weeks for the body just to basically go back to basic again. But then basically when we do incorporate these things in our diet, we can metabolise these things more effectively. I'm going to wrap up because um, I could speak to you forever and I, oh, I've got your me. books, <laughs> I, I've looked at your programs, I've followed your programs, I've followed your uh, nutritional planning and truly you walk your talk and uh, if anyone is lucky enough to ever meet you in person, you <laughs> radiate from across the room, like you can literally be tucked away in a corner of a room and you know where Zoe is because <laughs> it, you are the beacon of good health and beauty. So really you... I think that, you, that would, I'm sure that would be my husband saying that Zoe's just got a loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly a beauty. But I would like to know what does ageless mean to you as you're 42, yeah. you, you know, you're entering that next phase of your uh, yeah. life journey. What what does it mean to you? And what what do you what yeah. do you hope for for the next, you know, 45 years of your life? Well, I, I get quite excited because it's about self-forgiveness. That's that's the number one thing that I have learned about. I mean, I've had anxiety and I've had depression. I got Ross River virus three years ago and it really blew my mind because I wasn't coping, um, I delved into the world of kind of trying to understand what was this little voice in Zoe's head that told her something, you know, whatever that might be. And I just worked, I've just worked really hard on self-forgiveness. And I, I sit there and go, who cares, you know, and I just have a positive dialogue. Even when the shit's hitting the fan, I'm still trying to just laugh, you know, and be positive because I've just noticed that when I feel that way, I feel ageless. I feel more in touch with my daughter. I 
kind of understand my mum a little bit more. I, I don't put that, I don't block myself into that one little box, you know, that maybe I thought was me. I let myself kind of constantly keep moving, be fluid, but I definitely know that I'm now able for the next 40 years of my life or 50 years of my life or however long I'm on this world to be kind to myself. And I feel that that is the basis of, of ageless ageless females. I, I really do. And, um, of course, your gorgeous husband, Michael, is a trainer by background and is very yes. involved in the wellness, fitness, ageless industry. Um, what What is your fitness routine to remain ageless, yeah. vital, fit, yeah. glowing? So that's really important when it comes to hormones because that's changed hugely. You know, I was someone that very much was driven by, you know, the bit, the burn, the sweat, like, you know, the feel, feel the process. Um, and I think as I've got older, you know, the, the period of going through IVF was very frustrating for my type of personality because I really knew that that wasn't the best thing to kind of do that type of exercise. But I was still young. I was still, my body was still able to do that exercise. Now at 43, I'm much more inclined to do a lot of uh, the, the most sort of aggressive, if you like, I would do would be sort of a hip pilate, a hot hip Pilates. But as I was doing that this morning, you know, and I came out sort of all cherry red and what have you, I, I don't do that more than twice a week because it's just not good for my adrenals. It's just not good to increase those cortisol levels when, as we know, our body is already, you know, having a response hormonally with our cortisol levels as it is. So I find that it's a real balance of walking, I do a lot of yoga. I've always been a massive fan of yoga. So you can be, it can be a hot yoga, but it can also be sort of a more sort of passive yin type yoga. Um, but I do find I do need to do something every day. Uh, the other thing that's changed a lot is I studied Transcendental Meditation last year and I find that any form of meditation is fine. So what I've definitely noticed from doing, you know, I was very dedicated for a year. I'm probably not as I would, I don't quite do the two a day, but I find I can drop into that neurology a lot faster now. And I think that's kind of where that self-forgiving conversation. So I can actually do sort of more active forms of meditation now that I can do when I'm sitting here. I can drop into that mindset a lot faster as well. So those tools, my, my armor chest, my treasure chest, if you like, is, is always being added to. What do you do to look after your skin? Oh, lots. <laughs> so, look, obviously nutrition, it's its the big one. You know, I, I drink a huge amount of water. I take lots of things like my fish oils. Um, I've got big anti-inflammatories, my turmeric. I've got lots of things like my um, adaptogenic type herbs, like lithium, very mood stabilising type herbs. Um, like I said before, I'm a big believer of my juice as well. But I do have a strong skin regime and I find that that changes. I sometimes use Rationale for a little bit. I sometimes use ASOP for a little bit as well. So, so you're really going from clinical to natural base. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So I find for me that I have to kind of flow within the two. Uh, I've found, and I've used both of those for probably, you know, 15 years, I think I've used, been using both of those products. Um in wintertime, rationale is not great for my skin. I need a very, I need lots of nourishment. So I need a lot of these oils. I don't need as much activity. I just need a good cleanse rate, a cleansing regime. I find that that, you know, it's just very important that I've just got enough, you know, cleansing processes happening as well. Um, I'm probably more on that sort of dehydrated type, um, type, you know, skin type. So I, I do require a lot more hydration. So, I, yeah, I just sort of, I read where my body is. And I add to what that is. So I think that's what's really important. There is not one, as a nutritionist and a holistic health practitioner, uh, there is not one area. Um, like I said, I'm also a big fan of CBD. That's something that's helped me quite a lot through my anxiety. Uh, obviously, it's very important that you get a prescription. It's an area that I'm you know, very passionate about and it's an area that I'm going to go into as, you know, when when the time is right because I believe it's, an, it's something that we can tap into which is quite accessible as well. And anxiety is the one thing that will kind of unravel everything in me. So it will stop my nutrition being good. It will stop my mindset being good. Um, you know, I'll go into those dark places, if you like, that, you know, we've probably, hopefully not all of us, but most of us have sort of tapped into through the course of our time. So, um, and I also work with a psychiatrist. I work with a psychotherapist. 
I work with these people and they help me learn because, you know, you need to be taught constantly throughout your life when I'm unraveling or when, and, and even one of my, you know, my psychiatrist said the other day, said, you know, so it's really interesting because you're one of these people that can constantly keep pushing forward. So we have to now devise a new barometer of fatigue. So I have a new barometer. One of my barometers is that I'll notice that my, my neck will start fizzing, like we'll have that sort of radiating feeling and I know now that that is a trigger of my fatigue so I've had to use isn't that interesting that you need to get a neck uh, pain to know that you're tired yeah well it's I think what it is is I'm someone who mentally can over I've got a high pain threshold emotionally my mum's been very sick my entire life I've kind of learned to adapt to pain um, and so I'm probably not in touch enough through the course in my 43 years of knowing that. But so I've had to tap into the physical form of pain and I've had to let that be my guide, which I think is important that we kind of use any part of our body because, you know, the mind is a problem solving machine. It's not always, you know, sometimes we think it will guide us emotionally. No, it's trying to guide you to avoid that painful thing that happened to you. Now, up, that if drinking alcohol is the quickest way to do it, it's not the healthiest way to do it. But the brain's telling you to do that because that's the way it's learned before. So it's really important that we sort of tap into using all modalities, whether it be our spiritual health, our physical health, uh, to help us guide us through, you know, what might be areas that aren't serving us very well. Oh, I love speaking to you. And again, <laughs> there's so many, there's so many facets of you. And I'll be linking um, you, you wrote for rescue for a number of years. So we've got some yeah. amazing gems of articles on the site, which I'm going to link to, but also I'll link out to you if anyone wants to get in contact with you and um, buy your books and yeah. participate in your courses. But yeah. I want to thank you so much for oh, sharing your wisdom and experience you. with uh Ageless mm-hmm. by Rescue. Thank you so much. Oh, and look, you know. Absolute credit to you, darling. You've created and, and you've been such a pioneer and you've stayed in this industry and you're a wonderful support to all women. So so I, I appreciate you for that. Thank you. Always <laughs> wonderful to talk to you. I will speak to you soon, my love. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please share and rate this episode. I'd love that.